Hello and welcome back to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos and um, it's been a while, um, a long while since uh, I've recorded an episode, so I'm thrilled to do it again. And this time I am with Renee Ropak, who is a senior research associate at Data Collaborative for Justice at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. So um, we haven't actually met in person, but Renee is my colleague, and he is the co-author uh, with Michael Rempel of a report that was uh, released last week um, called New York City Criminal Justice, I mean, I'm sorry, called Does New York's Bail Reform Law Impact Recidivism? A Quasi-Experimental Test in New York City. And with a name like that, you know, it's it's everyone's going to love it. So anyway, welcome and thanks for um, thanks for talking to me. Hey, Peter, thanks for having me. Um, so we actually got together um, kind of through Twitter because I saw this report and um, in my defense, I did not attack it, but I had questions. And I think some of these questions are too technical to really resolve on on, on Twitter. Um, and so I asked uh, Renee if he would be willing to talk at length with me about this report. It's also fair warning that this um, is not directly about policing. And if you're here for that, um, <laughs> if you don't like how this episode starts, it's not going to get any better. Uh, but um, that said, uh, I think this is important to talk about how bail reform has um, changed New York City. Maybe first... Um, very briefly, I, I, anyone listening to this is probably going to know, but can you just can you describe what bail reform is in New York? So yeah, bail reform um, it took effect on January 1, 2020. That's the well, the first iteration uh, took effect that day. And there's two key components of bail reform that we tested in the study. And one was the prohibition of cash bail for select cases. That's mostly misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. And then um, it also led to the reduced use of bail for cases that were still eligible for it. And that's uh, that's virtually all um, violent felonies. And that reduced use of bail is basically the result of making supervised release universally available. So originally it was not available for people charged with violent felonies, but uh, it became available for those individuals. Um, it also added the least restrictive release condition provision, which means that judges have to use the least restrictive uh, re uh, release pro um, uh, release decision to ensure that people come back to court. And uh, it also added the language of flight risk. So judges have to consider flight risk and not just fail failure to appear risk when they make release decisions. And so criticism of this, if I could um, mention it, uh, which I share, actually. So New York does not consider dangerousness. Now, this was not directly part of bail reform. New York never did. But before bail reform, there were ways to get around that where judges could say this person is too dangerous to be released. Um, I believe every other state in D.C. have some standard of dangerousness. So that's one criticism of bail reform. There are um, there's certain exceptions of people who can be held. It doesn't apply to people now who do a lot of the same offense over and over again. They can, they become, and correct me if I'm wrong about any of this, they, um, people who commit the same offense repeatedly can be held on bails. Uh, domestic violence, sex crimes, I think are excluded. Um, but the goal of bail reform was to put fewer people uh, in jail, in Rikers, uh, we'll say, uh, while pending adjudication of their case. Um, it it went into effect January 1st, 2020. It actually de facto went into effect earlier because it had to be ready by 2020. And I mentioned that because um, the study and the data that I ran, we're looking at, we're comparing the first half of 2019 and the first half of 2021. Um, 2020, and that's, I think that's that's a good time frame. 2020, of course, was COVID and everything else. Um, and the second half of 2019, uh, bail reform was already partially in effect, especially by the end. So pretty much everything we're talking about is going to compare six Jan through June 9, 2019 and Jan through June uh, 2021. Um, the, when this study was released, I noticed, I just... <laughs> Uh, right before we started. So, I, I mean, this is part of the problem. I think you get two sides talking past each other. So um, New York Newsday reported uh, the headline was um, state bail reform law reduces recidivism in NYC, new study says. 
Um, meanwhile, on the same day, uh, which was March 15th, um, the New York Post says NYC suspects busted in serious crimes more likely to be re- rearrested under bail reform study. There's a colon there in the headline. Um, those aren't mutually exclusive, of course. Um, those are different ways to, I don't know if I should use the word spin, but I can't think of a good synonym. Those are different ways to present um, the data. Um, but I noticed, and this is actually was my first objection that I've just read. And did you, you don't have to rat anybody out here, but did you write the summary that's um, on the... Uh, on the DCJ landing page. When yeah, you, um, I was in findings. I didn't exclusively writing. I was involved in the writing um, of that summary. Yeah, um, because the summary talks about. I mean, uh, the first point. You know, there are four points, four bullet points: eliminating bail for most misdemeanor and non-felony violent charges, reduced recidivism, and then there's a little some data. Um, the last point is beyond the aforementioned overall takeaways, bail reform had varying recidivism effects depending on people's charges and recent criminal history, um, which to me hides a lot. Like I'm not opposed to bail reform. Mm-hmm. Um, and maybe describe the good first. Maybe describe the misdemeanor part, if you would. What what were the what did you find there? Um, sure. So so as you say, there's four bullet points um, on the landing page. The first one, and you know, the way we went about it, um, as I think many studies. Let me just mention if anyone, I mean, you can Google it, Google it, um oh, yeah. Renee Ropak, R-O-P-A-C, and Rempel, R-E-M-P-E-L, and it's at data collaborative for justice.org. That's right. Um, so yeah, we we started with the overall findings. Um, you know, that's the first two bullet points: the overall findings for the cases that were made bail ineligible, and then the overall findings for the cases that remained bail eligible. The third bullet point, actually, in a way, is a subgroup result that you know addresses the cases that were affected by the 20, mid-2020 amendments that took effect on July 2nd, 2020, where they basically rolled back some of the provisions um, that, that um, you know, were um, implemented on January 1. So they, they picked select cases and they made them bail eligible once again. Uh, and you, the, on July 2nd, I don't know, maybe you said that. I thought you said January 2nd, July 2nd. I think I said July 2nd, but okay. thank, yeah, just just we're on the safe side. Yeah, July 2nd is when the amendments took effect, yeah. And then the last bullet point uh, refers to the subgroup results um, of both the bail eligible and the bail ineligible um, analyses. And, and I can, you know, and I think, you know, the question is fair why do we not go into much detail on that landing page regarding those subgroup results um and we you know like there were different drafts like our main impulse was and you know all four bullet points are pretty vague in a way like once you look at the overall report the full report you'll see much more detail regarding all four bullet points but we really wanted to encourage people to actually read the report uh, or (laughs) or at the very least the summary and, um, you know, I think given that we looked at multiple different subgroups um, and, and they differed between the bail eligible and the bail ineligible slightly, um, it was very, it would have been quite difficult to keep it concise as well as informative um, in on that landing page. Um, and as you point out for what it's worth, I don't think um I, I I disagree with the word hidden a little bit. I don't think they were hidden and and for what, what it's worth, the coverage that I saw, um most people who covered it um either on TV or on radio or in newspapers were well aware of those subgroup results. So um you know, that's that. I think you know in, when you go to the summary, that's a three page summary of the whole 50 page report. Um, we dedicate um, we dedicate uh, several paragraphs or at least a few paragraphs to the subgroup results and they go in more detail. And then in the full report, we dedicate several pages in both the chapter regarding the bail eligible and the bail ineligible population on uh, addressing those subgroup results. At the end of each chapter, there's also an upshot section. So what's the upshot of 
of the of the analysis presented, and we address um, again the subgroup results in those upshot sections. And then at the very end, we address we dedicate an entire page again to those subgroup results in the conclusion chapter, where we also um, make a couple um, uh, policy suggestions based on those results. So I think, you know, um, and and depending on maybe the leaning of the reader, the, you know, uh, any predispositions that readers may have, I think some readers found it easier than others, but I don't think um, we were too shy about the subgroup results um, anywhere. I want to get to those policy suggestions maybe later. Um, mm -hmm. Because partly, like, unless... This doesn't apply to the study so much, but I always I, I feel and I've expressed, I think, the political left and the progressive left in particular sort of abdicating public safety responsibilities. And my fear is that leads a vo leaves a void that will be um, sort of usurped by um, reactionary right wingers. Um, so ultimately, at a policy level, that's sort of my interest is I want the best policy. So Partly when I'm reading this report, because it is you're describing what is now the status quo, like this sounds funny to say, but I don't care about what works. I mean, that's great. I, I do care, of course, but it's like, I, OK, that works. What I care about, what isn't working, mm -hmm. um, which is why I and I also, you know, particularly concerned about crime and recidivism and violent, um, violent uh, reoffending. So like so part of the. Um, there's, uh, I'll just quote a sentence or two about the subgroups and this, because it's sort of my focus, and maybe it shouldn't be, but it is. Um, it's subgroups for which released, for which release increased recidivism. Um, in cases made subject to mandatory release with a pending case and or recent prior violent felony arrests, our estimates found that release without bail led to significantly more overall felony and violent felony rearrest. In cases remaining eligible for bail, both of our two research designs pointed to an increase in overall rearrest for people and a recent prior violent felony arrest. That's, I mean, that just jumps out at me like, whoa, uh, partly because it could be corrected. Um, I would say a strength of the study is that you have identified these subgroups. And that's why, of course, any talk about bail reform is too broad because it covers so much. Um, I mean, same with discovery reform. Um, even with like raise the age, though less so, because that's a little more specific. Uh, maybe, so what are the subgroups that you have broken these categories down into? Sure. So in, and they're slightly different between the two analyses. I'm going to start with the bail ineligible um, population. So we, and again, that's was mostly uh, misdemeanors and nonviolent felonies. There were really only a couple violent felonies that were made bail ineligible. And we can talk about those later too. Uh, really, yeah, anyways, um, let's start. So one subgroup analysis we did was by charge level or by charge category. So we, we split the bail ineligible sample between those who were charged with misdemeanors and those who were charged with felonies for the current arrest or at, the, at their arraignment, I should say, okay? And, you know, as you can see in, um, I don't know if you have to... If I could just mention uh, oh, yeah. uh, the time frame we're talking about, the first six months, we're talking about arraignment, um, not arrests. Mm -hmm. If people care, they're looking at the data. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Um, then the second um, subgroup analysis we did was by whether or not people had a criminal history. And here I should say, um, we only had data back to the beginning of 2017. So we could only calculate two year criminal histories. Um, so that's a data limitation. And that's why we also have the word recent in, in prior violent felony, because we, we only know about prior violent felony arrests that took place two years or less before the current arraignment and not anywhere before that, right? So that's something to keep in mind when we talk about those criminal history um, subgroups. But anyways, um, the second analysis was between those who had any prior arrest um, that was prosecuted versus those who did not. All right, they had a clean rap sheet in the last two years. 
The um, third subgroup analysis was between people who had either a pending case at the time of their arraignment uh, or people who did not have a pending case at the time of their arraignment. And then the uh, fourth and last subgroup analysis was whether or not people had a prior violent felony arrest that was prosecuted. And yeah. Yeah, go on. No, go on. No, sorry. Um, yeah, and then the only difference is for the bail eligible group, we did the same subgroup analyses with one exception. So we also looked at whether people had a pending case or not, whether people had any prior arrests or not, and whether or not people had any prior violent felony arrests. Um, apparently, but, I should say these categories make sense because they make sense, but also this is simply the way the data also is broken down. I mean, in um. And the I should have, where, where I I have the data. Where is it downloaded from? If people uh, the want to data actually... is a non-public OCA data set. So so there's the public OCA data set. That's the one you've used um, when you know you looked at the stats, um, and that's that's perfectly fine. But it has certain limitations, um, uh, and especially one limitation that is. Um, a big problem, I think, when we look at recidivism, that we don't have in the in the OCA data set that we received, um, and unfortunately, that is non-public. You know, I I would love a universe what, where. What's the limitation in the public one? Uh, it only tracks pre-trial rearrest. Tracks. And our we tracked rearrest over two years. We went beyond the pre-trial period to track rearrest, and we think um, that's you know, crucial when it comes to the public safety question, right? So, so um, the, basically critics of bail reform say, well, you know, getting rid of bail and therefore rid of detention is a problem because people who might be dangerous, they're no longer, um, you know, they're incapacitated by pretrial detention and um, therefore they can't reoffend, right? Um, but then there's also um, multiple studies that have shown that once people are released from pretrial detention, they are actually um, more likely uh, to reoffend than if they had they not been in pretrial detention in the first place. And that's not true for every individual. For that's, misdemeanors generally, though, you see that, right? Um I don't know if it's necessarily only for misdemeanors, but it's certainly not for high, quote unquote, high risk cases. So, you know, that doesn't apply. Like, it's basically a trade off between there's two mechanisms that pretrial detention has, which one is incapacitation. That's pretty straightforward, right? You can't reoffend outside the, in the community if you're not, if you're locked up. And the other one is the, is the criminogenic effect of pretrial detention. So, for example, you're detained. You say you lose your employment, you get out, you're more likely to um, commit another crime because, for example, you need money, right? Also, like, you meet some people in jail that are good criminal associates. That's part of it, too, I think. That's, that's, that's of course, part of it, too. And the problem is when we look at only pretrial rearrest, we um, put a lot of weight on the incapacitation effects. And we put very little attention. We pay very little attention to the elevated risk for some of so for some people, not for all people, but the elevated risk for some people who come out of jail and and you know are more likely to reoffend over you know basically once they're out. Um, that doesn't happen immediately, um, but it happens over time. And I think our study. Um, sh you know, indicates that this effect uh, or strongly suggests that this criminogenic effect outweighs the incapacitation effect for a uh, lower level, um, like people charged with lower level offenses. Yeah. And based on, well, I'll get into sort of my more primitive analysis later, but based on that, you, um, you see that too, uh, that a low level offense, it seems to be working and, and less so for more for violent offenses. Mm -hmm. There's a and category. May I interject real quick? Yeah. Um, it's an important point to keep in mind. You know, when you look at the um, population that was actually made bail ineligible, that was the vast majority of these people were charged with misdemeanors. And the vast majority of these people did not have a pending case. And the vast majority of these people did not have a recent prior VFO. And for all of these subgroups, uh, we actually did not see like we saw pretty strong effects in favor of bail reform so the effects the overall effects 
that we see like um basically which is that getting rid of or banning cash bail for all cases affected by it reduced recidivism those effects are much stronger for people um who are like quote unquote low risk based on their pending case status based on their prior vfo um history and and based on their current charge and that's why i think it's important to say, well, look, overall, it did have a positive effect. And as you say, it's not surprising that it did for most for misdemeanors and, and people like that. But that was the vast majority affected by the reform. So that's something not to forget. Like, for example, only 10% in the sample, um, about 10% in the sample had a pr recent prior VFO, and only about 15% had a pending case. So that's the vast minor or vast minority. <laughs> that's a small minority of cases affected by by that um, ban of cash bail. Right. So, so here. So when I did my, I tend to like simple analyses, um, partly because my statistical knowledge hits a ceiling at some point, um, and that's you know I'm not proud of that. I'm not saying that's. <laughs> Yeah, I don't understand those fancy uh, regressions. And so, I mean, I do understand them, but I, I, I know my limits. Um, and I also, mm -hmm. I worry when too much statistical analysis is done and it enters sort of a scribe class of understanding. Um, when I do my data analysis, I'm always thinking like, I want a smart person, not necessarily educated, a smart cop, for instance, to understand what I'm saying. So I do like simple sort of cross tabs uh, percentages, but I also think there's some honesty in that. I'm just defending my own primitive methods. And, but um, I'll defend mine in a second. Then. Yeah, no, and I want to, and I, and, um, I spe specifically want to get into that comparison group because I still don't understand uh, that. But so, mm -hmm. but here's, here's that feeling of, you know, don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining kind of thing. Like um, everything you said is true. Uh, so I, what I did, these are just simple cross tabs for six months, 2019 versus 2021. And of those arrested, this is not trimmed at all. This is everybody. And I, right. and I would make an argument that perhaps the implication of bail reform goes beyond those who are, would have been bail eligible because people simply would say that, you know, you could lose a deterrent effect hypothetically. Um, we, I'd love to talk about that too because that's a solid point, and I think this other mechan, this other causes for that potential effect as well. Well, let's do that now. I can get to these numbers later. They're staring at me, I can talk about them later. So why? So yeah, why? So you trim the sample um, to look at basically. If, and again, correct me if I'm wrong. These are all questions, frames of statements. Uh, you trim the sample to the group that basically was affected by the change in law, right? um that's correct yeah um so why yeah so what are the benefits i mean given the possible effect on other people why trim that sample in that way and and, and does it matter if you don't trim it that way uh, well i think it does that's why we did it um so you know if if you th if you look at um what what i think many people don't realize um I think you do, but I think a lot of people um, say on Twitter or in the public in general, people I talk to don't realize is that the vast majority of people who were made bail ineligible because of reform were already routinely released in New York City pre-reform. So, for example, um, you know, that's from a report uh, from the Criminal Justice Agency, descriptive statistics, just on the percentage of all cases that were released um, without cash bail. Um, so in 2019, there was 79% of all cases were released without bail. So either released under uh, on their own recognizance or under supervised release. And in 2020... Can I, can I just mention it because it's a peeve of mine? Supervised release, this is not your fault. Um, it's not very supervised. Um, I, I don't like the name, but it's been a huge change. Um, that's the one over the past couple of years, the percentage of people released under supervised release, which is... Um, as far as I understand, kind of a, you, you call up twice a week and it's, it's a way to connect people with, uh, social service agencies. And I'm not saying that's bad, uh, but it's not actually supervised, but anyway, but, it, but, but it's, it's been a huge increase in New York city and it, it might actually be good. I just don't like the name. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but I guess what I'm saying regarding the, why did we isolate cases that were practically affected by reform? So again, in 2019, 79% of all cases were released without cash bail. 
in 2020, after bail reform took effect, that number re, uh, increased to 83%. So we went from 79% pre-reform to 83% post-reform. And that, that released without bail. And that's important because, as you said, people don't know that. Um, Khalif Browder, notwithstanding this idea that people were doing years on Rikers for a nickel bag of weed, just that wasn't based in reality. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just in, in that sense, you could say it, it, the changes aren't as significant as everyone's making them out to be. Absolutely not. Yeah. I and, would say, can I? I'm sorry. I'm gonna, ahead, sorry. No, keep, go ahead. Yeah. Keep, um, there is one, and this will come back later, I think. Um, cops are arresting a lot fewer people. Um, I looked this up. This is total year, by the way, because that's what I have. In twenty nine, comparing twenty nineteen and twenty twenty one, arrests in New York City are down twenty three percent. Misdemeanor mm -hmm. arrests are down thirty one percent. So, the fact the the increase in people released is quite small, but arguably the sample has changed, um, which would you know, lessen that increase a little bit. I just want to mention it because I think it matters that we're, you know, if we're arresting 30% fewer misdemeanors. Anyway, my my argument slash theory is that you got to do more serious crimes now to get arrested. So that that's a factor that somehow in there, I would think. Right. And that's where that's where the matching comes in, right? Like, so, so, um, and, you know, so, so you start, you start out with the cross tab, right? And you compare mm -hmm. people who were, uh, or you compare the population um, of, you know, 2019, and in, in your case, what you did was 2021 because of the COVID effect. That makes perfect sense, especially when you look at pretrial arrest, right? Um, so you start out with a cross tab, and and you might have vastly different risk rates. Um, you know, inherent risk of rearrest in those two populations because they're different, right? Um, so what you can do um, is you all you plug in a few control variables, right? Let's control for charge level, let's control for criminal history and all that. And you'll get a more, you know, you get like a better estimate um, of what actually happened. We went beyond that, but it's not that. And so what you just described for those who don't know is kind of the basis of multivariate regression. Just, yes, correct. So, Cause sometimes people know these terms and I don't know, I like explaining yeah. things if I can. And what we did was one step further, but not really like the principle is very, it's basically the same as in a multivariate regression, right? So we basically um, made sure that the sample that we used uh, pre-reform, that's the first people arraigned in the first half of 2019, that that sample looks similar to the sample um, that we used for the post-reform um, um, analysis. And that's people arraigned in the first half of 2020. So we um, basically, the biggest impact was we trimmed cases, we dropped- You just said 2020, you mean 2020 or 2021? Well, our analysis was for 2020. Oh, okay. Um, I, I assumed you used 2021 for the reason of COVID. Um, I did, yeah. It, this is, which makes sense when you look at pretrial rearrest, especially when the cutoff is at 180 days, right? Yeah. However, since we followed every individual for two years, right, both our 2019 cohort and our 2020 cohort was affected by those low arrest numbers and the high decline to prosecution rates in 2020. So the the rearrest estimates are not actually affected by that 2020 um, say grace period where people could commit crimes and the chance that they would get arrested or prosecuted was significantly lower than in most other years, right? Right. Um, when you only when you do the cutoff at 180 days, well, then it would be problematic to use the 2020 sample, right? But since we follow everybody for two full years, um, you know, that's not a factor. But what 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 we did is basically, for example, say there's like um, you know, let's come up with a hypothetical case. They say a low level, uh, say a petty larceny with no criminal history whatsoever, right? Like a case like that was already almost always released pre-reform, um, even though they were bail eligible for it, right? Bail eligible. Um, Post-reform, they had to be released, but in practice, nothing changed for a case like that. So, so those types of cases we dropped from the analysis because the practical impact on those cases was zero. Right. Yeah, but um, doesn't that lead? So we're using arrests in effect as a proxy for crime. Say it um, again. 
we're using arrests as a measure of for public safety, or maybe only I'm doing. I mean, maybe some people are only thinking about the offender, but um, if you know you're not going to be like, I just I'm going back to that idea that the the potential of being held in jail, I think, serves as as a deterrent, especially for some of these smaller things, as opposed. To, and of course, there's some extreme cases like that guy on the subway that was arrested 150 times for you know scamming tourists at Metro card machines. Mm-hmm. Um, but like ultimately we're talking about the hate criminal behavior and arrests are a way to get at that because we don't actually know the crimes people commit short of mm-hmm. being arrested um i don't so but if you if you don't if you if you leave a okay go, go, i'm sorry go on thing. when we talk about the deterrent effect the potential deterrent effect of well i'm, I'm arrested there's the punk potential of of being detained pre-trial right Mm -hmm. well there's a couple things about that first of all then we shouldn't focus on recidivism at all because that could also apply to uh, people who have never been arrested before right um so you know somebody might be on the margins of offending or not and then bail reform was passed and they're like oh i can no longer be detained now i'm gonna commit crimes you know i don't know if that's plausible necessarily but it would affect not only recidivism but everybody right and then Top but, that, that, that's, I, but that's to me is important. I mean, that's why I'm saying this is why I want to. And of course, in the real world, you can't say and I won't say it's not all because of bail reform. But um, so, I mean, here's the let me just mention this one of these numbers. So I I, I, I like using a pending open case at the time of arrest mm-hmm. as sort of a backdoor into recidivism. So rather than saying, are you arrested after you're uh, released? I'm looking at whether you have an open case when you're arrested. Um, and for, uh, it went up for every category, but particularly for violent felony offenses. So just who are still bail eligible. Right. Right. But I'm, so, but I'm saying, I guess I'm saying that I think there's a greater impact here. Now, of course it could be something unrelated, but in a way, like my point isn't to pick apart bail reform, which I know is why I asked you to, you know, sort of be here. Um, but it's to say something happened here and bail reform is a likely suspect. Um, so for just under 5%, 4.8% of people in 2019 arrested for six months had a pending open violent felony case. Mm-hmm. And that doubled to 9.6% in 2021. So just under 10%. And we're talking about 45, 4,600 individuals have an open violent felony offense. Okay. Now that also means 90.4% don't. Uh, But there's a huge chunk of people that have open cases. And I guess part, and this isn't directly about the changes of bail reform, though it is a bit, is if you get arrested while having an open case, I kind of think you should stay in jail. Like we gave you another chance. Um, and it's it's what is the number? It's is it a quarter or a third, maybe even a, roughly a quarter, give or take, of people have an open case. Uh, maybe even a third. Is it that high? But that to me is a okay. That that, that to me is a problem. And uh, and it's all let's up. let's revisit the last point. I don't think I fully got that, but let me respond to the 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 stat that you just pointed out. Right, like yeah. those are people who had a pending violent felony um, case. Right. Yeah. And I think it's really important to keep in mind that those people were bail eligible other than certain burglary two cases, right? Like everybody or all, virtually everyone who's accused of a violent felony offense is bail eligible pre and post reform, all right? Mm-hmm. And and the whole thing with like taking away judge discretion, right? Like, okay, supervised release was expanded. So it was used more by judges, even though bail was still um, an option. And I think that made the biggest difference. I don't think the least restrictive condition made a big difference at all in, in, in release practices, not in recidivism, I should mention. Mm-hmm. And then the flight risk thing, well, you know, I don't think makes a big difference. And I, th- I say this because the, both the least restrictive condition necessary and the flight risk, well, that is really in the eye of the beholder, right? Like Like different judges might look at the same case and make very different assessments as to whether there's a flight risk or whether there's a least restrictive condition. And at the end of the day, a judge can still say, you know, I think this person 
um, is a risk of flight, and therefore I'm going to set bail or detain them. Um, and and my, I'm not aware of any mechanism or any any practice that is in place where 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 judges can, you know, be held accountable if 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 they do it quote unquote the wrong way because it's very subjective. What what the least restrictive condition is that's necessary is subjective, and what's what's a flight risk is also largely subjective. So I like in other words. You actually expand the judge discretion because of bail reform for the eligible cases, because before reform, supervised release was not an option for those violent offenses, right? After bail reform, it was. And, and they still have everything from, from, from ROR, uh, release on recognizance, to, to non-monetary release condition, primarily supervised release, um, to bail, to detention. All of these options are still available to judges. Yeah, and then, and then the supervised release basically took over the ROR group. I mean, where before someone would have been ROR'd, and that's then that's what happened. Ahead. That's what in pra happened in practice, right? Yeah. Um, and and our analysis for that population basically, we did not find an effect in either direction. You know, you compare people who were bailed or detained by judges in 2019 who were who remained bail eligible, right? And we compared the two statistically similar people, that is people with similar criminal history, similar charges, demographics, arraignment borrow, all of that. And we compared their recidivism rates with people who were um, released without bail in 2020. And yeah, that's so, I guess this is more of a general complaint against macro, um, against quantitative methods, but and I, I mean, I know there's no great answer to this, but like, how do you know you're accounting for all the variables? Like, I'm always skeptic when I hear similar people because well, they're people. No, right. But like with a cross tab, you're not accounting for anything. No, but at least I'm getting the big picture. At least I know there's a change overall. Like this, is, I, it's hard. What I can't do then is really say why as much. I mean, that's what I lose. But this idea that every bit indicator of recidivism no, and, and you know like that's fair enough there are unobserved characteristics that we couldn't account for that's that's in our limitation section we're not making no i know and I, 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 no I, i'm not accusing you of no, that no, no, I, no, but, I, but there's this this idea that with the exception of 180 day re-arrest misdemeanor which actually is lower in 2021 by mm -hmm. small bit half half a percentage point every indicator of re-arrest is up um every well, bit of pending open cases is up um there's one other thing which i looked at uh and it's not a huge change but it's a change in 2019 30 um percent of people arrested with pending open cases had bail set which means 70 percent pre-bail reform were let out this is with pending open cases mm -hmm. um that went down now it's 25 percent of people arrested are held so what do you mean by now what year is that uh, this is first uh, six months, 2021. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, the amendments, the twenty twenty mid 2020 amendments that took effect on July 2nd actually allow in most cases to set bail on such cases, right? Like that's the so-called harm, harm provision. And what that basically is, is like, so if you have a, like harm, like if you have a case that involves the harm to a person or property, so basically a non-victimless crime, right? And they also didn't, of course, not exactly define what that means. That's again, in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, prostitution would not be in included in that or drug possession, right? Victimless crimes. Um, so, so if you have- a, What about you, shoplifting? Shoplifting would be, well, in our analysis, we consider that a harm to property case, okay. yes. Um, so if you are um, arrested and, or prosecuted for a, har a case that involves the harm uh, to a person or property, and you have a pending case that meets the same criterion, since July 2nd, you can absolutely set bail on a case like that. Well, I assume the ones who are being released are for, yeah, the, the lesser offenses, but it has increased. I just, I, I can't figure out if so many people have more, more open pending cases when they're arrested and then I'm also being told that recidivism is down and that that's... Well, that's the, what I can't quite get my head around. Sure. Well, I mean, look, one other thing that happened, um, not so much in 2021, though a little bit, because I also poked around um, with the public data set just so we're on the same page, um, cases were a little longer. Well, cases were much longer in 2020, right? So you're much more likely to have an open case. Because they weren't adjudicated quickly the year before. That, that's a very good point. 
Yeah, and they were also still longer in 2021. And I don't want to overstate the 21, 21 stat because I actually looked at that specifically. I know it for 2020. For 2021, they were still slightly longer. So I'm not going to claim that this explains all of it, but it explains some of it. And it's also important, again, when you look at 2021, those cases were most of them were bail eligible. Petty, petty larceny, if you have a pending petty larceny case and you're arrested and prosecuted again for a petty larceny case, the harm harm provision says you're allowed to set bail on that. And why they didn't, well, that's a different question. But like, again, you know, that's kind of with the trend that we've seen. And I'm referring again to that CJA paper where we look, they looked at um, trends in bail setting practices between 1987 and um, 2020. And it's been steadily going down. And as I said, like by the end, we were at 79% released without money in 2019. And it only went up to 83% in 2020. So what I'm what I'm getting at with that stat is like, even if among and, and our study found the opposite, just for the record, but even if among that small population that was in practice affected by those reforms, even if recidivism went up among these people, it still certainly could not account for the crime increases that took place in 2020, because mathematically it affected so few cases. Oh, yeah. And I mean, may, maybe we should emphasize that when, because we both agree on that. Uh, it's just, yeah, yeah um, I, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that bail reform caused a 30% increase in murders. Um, or in New York, you know, for a while, shootings quadrupled. Uh, I don't blame bail reform for that. But I also think it, you know, at some point, if you release uh, 2,000 people from Rikers, some of them are going to commit crimes. I, you know, and again, me, that's separate. From that's bail separate. Bail. That's you know, separate. I think, well, I think this, so, this is why the... I find it frustrating, because we're talking about bail reform. And, um, and no, I don't think the rise in violence was from bail reform. If I talk to someone else about raise the age, which has increased recidivism among 16 year olds, which seems very counterproductive. Uh, they say, well, that's just a minor part. And then um, I talk about, you know, disclosure and they say, well, that's just a minor part. Like at some point, like, I don't, this is, I, I don't know if you saw, I wrote a piece recently. Anyway, I compared it to the game of Jenga. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, I think like, I saw that. I think I saw that um, article by yours. Yeah. Yeah. It was by uh, me and John Hall. Um, and, like each, I think each part contributes in a small way, and I think collectively it was a problem. Um, but to say it's it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. Well, it's, it's something, and I'm 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 afraid that the again because it is wrapped in politics that if we and I say we of the I assume I don't know your politics, but uh, I'm uh, of the, of the left of center persuasion. Um, we're going to get just run over by people say, stop making excuses, like whatever, we'll just lock them all up. Um, bail, like if, if, if advocates for bail reform would simply say, oh, well, there's a problem, you know, point out the good parts. Um, and, but there's a problem here with repeat violent felony arrests. Okay, so let's work on that. Like, why aren't judges giving bail? That's another question, but let's figure it out. Like, let's not be so narrow as to only say this law works. Um, it's okay. At I, least complete, I completely agree with that. Um, yeah. You know, and and um, just one thing about, um, I'm sorry about that. If you hear that on my end, I get like um, some notifications here. <laughs> um, what I, you know, what's important to keep in mind is, um, as you say, a lot of things have changed in 2020, right? And, and again, we, we laser, we were laser focused on cases that were practically affected by bail reform. And among that population, we found a decrease in recidivism. Right. So what I'm saying is like, I'm not denying that recidivism went up. I mean, you you can look you can look at the OCA public data set and anybody with some, you know, fundamental skills can can run those cross tabs and see it. But what I'm saying is that in the absence of bail reform or specifically in the absence of banning cash bail, those recidivism rates would even be higher. That's what our study indicates. Um, you know, and one thing about race the age. I don't want well, to cite. I should them. say the recidivism, of course, after they're leaving, past the time frame of the incapacitation effect of 
being in jail. So there's at least it would be delayed recidivism for better or for worse. Right. Like, so that's a good point. Let me, let me, again, I, I pulled a couple stats here. Um, so what we found in our paper um, for bail ineligible people, the average incarceration time in the two years following their arraignment, and think that includes both pretrial and post-trial incarceration. It's an estimate. We couldn't perfectly measure that, but pretty close. The average time was 60 days. So people were for detained for two months on average out of 24 months. So the idea that, well, if we just set bail, like, you know, getting rid of bail and therefore people can't be detained and then they're out in the community and reoffend, well, that happens anyways, right? Like after two months on average, they're out back in the community. Um, so whether even when you set bail, because most people still make bail in during the pretrial period, you know, I, I think you know what of, percent of people are actually held entirely through adjudication for um, that's not a lot of people. I, it's in the report. Um, let me I can. Um, I don't want to keep the listeners waiting here too much, but we look well, they're at, still with us. They'll wait another minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, in um in the bail ineligible population right yeah um 90 percent were released on recognizance um well that's that's pre like that's both pre and post reform right uh, um then 10 percent were released on non-monetary conditions 1.6 percent were remanded that means the judge held them in jail without even setting bail um and then yeah, so that that's basically that's basically how it breaks down. And um, what is your question? How many people were held for the entirety of the two? I'm years? just wondering if you knew, but I, I have know. that in the report. We did a we did a supplemental analysis. Let me just try to find it. Um, or, or don't, whatever. <laughs> I can find it on my own. Okay. But it's not a lot of people. Like, yeah, no, I know. From the top of my head, it's a very um, small number of people. So let me. So the other thing, maybe the last thing, or maybe not, I want to get to. So you compared, I should also mention the very beginning, I said this was referring to 2019 and 2021, and I was wrong. As you pointed out, you're talking about 2020, but I want to make that clear that mm -hmm. I started this with that error. Um, you had two, you you had sort of a before after sample group that I think is relatively easy to understand. Mm -hmm. And then you had this second group. And can you explain what that is? And I'm going to see if I can understand it. Yeah. So we did that for only the bail eligible analysis, right? Because we would have done it for the bail ineligible, but of course, everybody had to be released. So there's no comparison, you know. Ah, okay. Well, that clarifies one part. That, that right. was one so, of my one. So... So we wanted, like what we did, like we did a pre and post analysis, which I already described, but just, you know, it might be easier to follow if I repeat it one more time. So we compared people in all analyses. Um, that is, so we actually did three types of analysis for the bail, for the population that was made bail ineligible, for the population that remained bail eligible, and then for the subgroup um, that was affected by the mid 2020 amendments. That is the types of cases that were imp that were made bail eligible once again only half a year after they were made bail ineligible by let's call it original bail reform, right? Mm -hmm. So have the pre um, the pre bail reform group. Um, so people who were bailed or detained in 2019. And then we compared that to those recidivism rates to a matched comparison group of people who were released without bail in 2020. Okay. Um, and so in, in the for the bail ineligible population, um, that's the only analysis we ran. For the bail eligible population, so judges were still able to set bail even after reform, we also were able to do the following, which is the, let's say, the contemporaneous analysis. So here we compared people who, um, who were released without bail in 2020 to statistically similar people, and again, by like charge, criminal history, demographics, and so forth, um, to statistically similar people who were bailed or remanded also in 2020 in the same time period. And the reason why we did this is because I think it's always a good idea to look at something from multiple angles, right? If we have right. the opportunity. For mandatory release, it wasn't possible because nobody was bailed or remanded 
in 2020 because it was literally banned, right? For the bail eligible, we could do that. And that's similar. Like, wouldn't you... judges have kept them even with similar uh, characteristics on paper? Wouldn't have judges been, and I know you look at specific judges. Um, I'm still just, I assume but that's we... where discretion comes in and people are actually trying to detain the people that most need to be detained. Sure. So there's two, two things here, right? Like one is, are there any characteristics that we missed in our data that the judge um, used to make a determination, of course. Another thing is, and we know that's true, there's different propensities that, of judges to release people. Some judges are more likely to release people and, than others, even if they're if if they have the same case in front of them, right? So there's yeah. an, some inherent randomness in judge decision making, um, and you know, so so and and so i think like looking at it from both of those angles just gives us a more robust idea of what the effect of setting bail versus not sending bail actually has mm -hmm. and like you mentioned the race the age um paper earlier i was actually involved in that paper and mm -hmm. so what we did there we compared 16 year olds so 16 year olds um were they raised the age for 16 year olds in 2018 and for um 17 year olds in 2019 right so in 2018, only 16-year-olds were offended, uh, affected by race the age. In 2019, 17-year-olds were then also affected by race the age. So what we did there, we compared the recidivism rates for 16-year-olds affected by race the age. So in 2018, um, uh, to the recidivism rates of 16-year-olds from 2017 before race the age took effect. What we also did, and you know, with pre-post analyses, even without COVID, you always have the problem, well, things might have changed within that year. Policing might have changed. Um, other things might have changed. Maybe the weather was just crappier, so people were less outside, whatever it may be, right? So pre-post analysis will always have that type of limitation. So what we then did in the Race the Age paper, we also compared the recidivism rates for 16-year-olds then who were affected by race the age with the 17 year olds who were not yet affected by it right mm -hmm. and in the race the age paper we we basically found the same pattern we found higher recidivism rates for the 16 year olds who um, were affected by race the age compared to the 16 year olds the year prior and compared to the seven year 17 year olds arranged the same year but not yet affected by the policy so would so to me that means raise the age if the goal was to reduce recidivism it failed right well that study strongly suggests that absolutely yeah okay I'm just um, and and you know i think there's for what it's worth you know it's i know that there's more studies to be published on that and i think we never should take one study's findings as gospel right and that's that that sounds good coming from someone who makes the studies because of course not but what yeah. i find interesting about that report is that and this is why I, I, I start to think that some of the people who push for these laws are not actually honest or well-intentioned. Like, I, I, if if your only goal is to reduce incarceration, you don't care about recidivism as long as people aren't locked up for it. I'm surprised how little effect that study had. Like, wow, this is important. Um, it right. failed at what it was trying to do, and no one seems to care. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if nobody cared. I mean, I think, you know, but like besides, I, I mean, the, the reason I pointed out the race stage study is because we did a similar approach. We had a pre-post, but when we also did we also did a contemporaneous analysis between two groups that were highly similar, 16-year-olds and 17. Yeah. And pre-post, uh, I mean, first you have seasonal problems, so you have to look at a whole year. And then of course 2020 is sort of like all bets are off. Right. So. so 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 we did that's why we also did the contemporaneous analysis for the bail eligible, because we were able to, and because we wanted to have a more robust idea of what's going on. And the, the contrast in results is in the race the age study, um, both analyses yielded basically the same results and conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. In our content in our analysis on the bail eligible population, those two designs actually yielded slightly different results. Um, one design, the pre-post design, suggested a slight increase in recidivism. Um, the contemporaneous design, however, suggested a very slight decrease in um, recidivism. And again, those those differences were very small and they go the opposite direction. And then we also looked at, we used survival analyses where instead of a two-year tracking period, we used a two and a half year tracking period for some cases, right? Mm -hmm. 
and and in both of these uh, analyses, th those results did no longer no longer showed up as statistically significant. So so those results were not robust within the design, and they were also uh, slightly you know going slightly like they looked into they went to di into different directions um, depending on the pre post or the contemporaneous approach. But again, the effect sizes were very, very small, and that's why our overall conclusion is. Um, you know, that reducing the use of bail for the cases that are still eligible for it probably did not have an effect on recidivism in either direction. So let's reward anybody who's um, been interested in this for more than an hour. Um, I am, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I don't want it to go on forever. Um, what? I, let's talk about that. Let's give some candy out. What are the policy recommendations? Where do we go from here? So... Before I go into policy recommendation, I promise you I'll keep it short. What I what I think um, should have maybe gotten a little more um, attention to, you know, you uh, is the 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 fifth chapter, which looks at the amendments, right? Mm -hmm. So they they made certain cases bail eligible once again, and in practice in New York City, there was three types of cases. There was burglary two cases. Um, but only for a subset of burglary two cases. Uh, you which gotta, is, you have to, we like we got to define burglary two. And uh, I can't well, do it off the top of my head. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can't do it <laughs> either uh, from the top of my head. I, th I think it would butcher it. Um, we can pull well, it up. Let's let's yeah. not do it wrong, then. Well, people can Google bur burglary two in New York. Um, yeah. But it, it affected three types of cases. That was those burglary cases, which is a uh, uh, violent felony offense, for what it's mm -hmm. worth, right? Then we have the harm, harm cases. I described those earlier, like the current case uh, involves the harm to a personal property. And there's a pending case um, with the same characteristic. And then the third category was misdemeanor domestic violence cases that involve the obstruction of breathing or blood, blood circulation. Those three types of cases accounted for more than 90% of all cases that were made bail eligible once again on July 2nd, okay? Okay. And for that subpopulation, we did the same pre-post analysis. We didn't have data to look at what happened after that reform passed, but what we did is look at, again, people arraigned in the first half of 2019 compared to sim similar people arraigned in the first half of 2020. And, and we found that those who were released without bail in 2020 with those select charges or select cases had higher recidivism rates than those who were um uh, bailed or detained in 2019. In other words, this strongly suggests that the 2020 amendments um, further in, uh, increased or further were further beneficial to public safety or beneficial to recidivism. So the methods there are similar to looking at those 16 and 70 year old, 17 year olds, because there's a different time period that the change happens. Is that is that a? Um, well, the. It's basically the same method that we used for the main analysis or for all analysis, just okay. to pre-post what happened after original bail reform was passed compared to before bail reform, right? And then well, the amendments were good is the short. That's the, yeah, that's the upshot is the amendments were by and large good in terms of like when we only look at public safety or like recidivism as the outcome variable. There's of course trade-offs, right? Um you know, like pe more people are detained and that, you know, comes with um, consequences as well. But from Someone simply- call that a feature and not a flaw, just saying, but um, especially but if you're dealing with a, strangulation. Simply from a recidivism, simply yeah. from a recidivism perspective, um, those amendments reduced recidivism. Yes. Okay. And does that lead into other yeah. proposed changes? And then what we found for the mandatory release population, um, the strongest, uh, the, the most um, consistent and strong effects we saw is that people who were mandatorily released post-reform who had a pending case at the time of the arraignment and people who were mandatorily released post-reform who had a pr recent, pri uh, recent violent felony arrest, for those two groups, recidivism went up post-reform, okay? And again, I should know, I should just, I just want to also add that every time 15% of all people had a pending case and only 10% of all people had a prior VFO. So that's a small minority of cases affected by the mandatory release provision. However, in 
it's it's undeniable that for that subgroup recidivism went up and that's when we get into the policy um suggestions mm -hmm. uh, one one quick question yeah. before you do i'm trying i'm looking at the report i don't i can't find it quickly the changes in in tw july 2020 what percent of people arrested did the, that affect um so of the small that, right yeah six percent basically okay. so only six percent of the cases arraigned in 2020 um were those types of cases okay oh in the first half of 2020 i want to be precise uh, were actually those types of cases right okay. so it was a small minority um but you know we say you know and that's you know i don't again <laughs> Um, that's on the, in, in the on the entire last page of the report in the conclusion section when we actually make policy suggestions. I, I don't want to necessarily call it a recommendation because I'm not in the business of making policy. I'm in the business of you know um, trying to show what what happened, and um, the policy making is in somebody else's wheelhouse. But we did point out that, for example. Future legislation or policy may might may, might make fewer high risk individuals, say for example, people with a prior violent felony arrest, subject to mandatory release. What page of the report are you on? Pardon? What page of the report are you on? Uh, Forty four. Okay. Right. Go on. <laughs> yeah. So we're we're basically suggesting for certain cases, from a public safety perspective, it. Uh, it, it could be considered to give that judge discretion back uh, where they can set bail again if people have, for example, pending cases, even if it's not a harm harm case, or if people have a prior violent felony arrest. Um, uh, you know, again, in our in our study, we only have in the last two years. Um, that's also something to consider. I don't know the effects of people who had a prior violent felony arrest 10 years ago. Maybe it's overkill to say those also should you know, be bail eligible again. I think generally research has shown that if you can de de desist for many years that you kind of, you're in a different category. It really is. That's a, right. Yeah. That's right. Exactly. So in a way, I think, you know, that that that's just something to keep in mind. And and we do make, you know, we, we do bring this up in the paper um, that there is certainly room for improvement. And but that on the other hand, I should say, you know, um, it could also benefit public safety if legislation or policy encouraged the release of more bail eligible people who are charged with relatively low level offenses or with no or minor criminal history. We found in the population of bail eligible people, and I know those were mostly people charged with a violent felony offense, right? Mm -hmm. But of those people, if they had no criminal history at all, we actually also found that release is conducive to public safety. In terms of their recidivism, I, in terms I of still, their recidivism rates, yeah. I still want well, public to, safety is a little bit, yeah. And again, this I'm talking purely in, in a theoretical sense here, not data based in this case, but I think there's a deterrent power that 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 ignores on basically if to, to give an example, if I'm arrested with a gun and immediately released, um, my friends uh, are going to. It sends it sends the wrong it sends the wrong. I don't normally don't like sending messages, but I think there's a message involved that hey, all right, that's what happens. Um, I would love it, and I don't think it's possible on a research level to be able to look at the social networks and the impact of of uh, policy changes on a person's you know friends, gang members, associates, professional colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, but that I, would, I mentioned. I mean, so there's one one thing to look at what's what's the recidivism of the offender and there's another on a community but that really is a whole another giant larger category um any thing you want to add before we wrap this up i think um i could talk about this for hours actually but um let's 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 say one thing about the deterrent effect because i think you know there's other reasons like say that's true right people are less deterred from committing crimes because of bail reform, and that uh, would not necessarily show up in our study, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think it's also important to keep in mind that there's other, many other reasons that I could come up with why people might be less deterred um, to commit crimes that have nothing to do with bail reform, right? Um, there was less policing, for example. There's less proactive policing. Well, that's the part I stress, yeah. Right. So, um, so people may 
assume may maybe wrongly that they can commit a crime and won't be caught um that doesn't mean it's true right um likewise um you know that's something i don't know much about um i know it from other people writing about it but say let's look at discovery reform right the, um when which has not gotten enough attention because it's even more boring than this stuff and i don't call no, I, don't, I actually <laughs> find discovery I'm, not boring at all but I, me least, you and me both <laughs> and that's why we're talking but a lot of people it's a it's a tough sell to talk about and, it. I, and, and i also should preface it this way i'm not endorsing that this have this effect. I'm just saying when we think of deterrent effect, it's a pretty vague concept. And when you look at discovery reform and what critics say is true, which I'm also not endorsing just because I don't know enough about it. So I'm not going to say on a podcast that this is definitely the case. But if dismissal rates are actually going up because of discovery reform, right? Like, wouldn't that have the exact same effect that you claim bail reform might have, right? Why, why, why would people care if they're caught if they know that their cases or if they know if they assume that their case is dismissed right yeah um so there's plenty other reasons i could come up with but those are the major ones where we're like okay if we look at deterrence well policing decreased uh police you know policing deters crimes there's plenty of research that strongly suggests that um we but, every, also, but so many people on twitter say it doesn't uh, well, but you're right yes go go on <laughs> um and then and then discovery reform perhaps right but it, it, i'm not like i'm not even fully convinced of the premise i'm not saying it's wrong but i would want to see actual evidence of some form and if it's a qualitative study that shows me the mechanisms you know it doesn't have to be quantitative study that shows it in in, in percentages or whatever like if people go out there and actually they they, they show me in, with credible research that this is a true mechanism that exists out in the world. Um, I think that would be great. I haven't seen anything like that. It's more just like, quote unquote, common sense. But many different people have many different common senses, right? Yeah, so, well, the effect, I guess that's why I, mean, I started by saying, you know, I don't in a way care which part of the system caused this. I mean, I asked my class of undergrads the other day, and I didn't ask him actually one mentioned, oh, everyone's carrying a knife now. I was like, what? Since when? And since recently, but I'm thinking, was that because we legalized small knives? Is that because, I mean, it, it's it's everything, of course, mm -hmm. but the effect is real. Um, I, by the way, do not think it's good that everyone now is carrying a knife, um, right. as they put it. But so, <laughs> I, you know, that that's what I want to counter so whatever deterrent was there before whether it was policing whether it was the law i mean the law matters uh whether it was punishment after you get caught or prosecution um something something ain't working right now i just want to you know the idea that we have to fix society go no i just want to get back to the level of violence new york city had a few years ago mm -hmm. um things were going better i think but um i mean another thing is also and and i i you know that's speculative um, but, you know, COVID happened and I think it changed things quite a bit. I'm not saying that because of COVID, you know, we see everything we see here. But when you look at New York City unemployment rate, it's much higher than in the in the years leading up to leading up to the pandemic and people having jobs. Um, absolutely. The studies on that, too. People having jobs uh, reduces um, crime. Right. Like like people who have a lot of time on their hands and maybe are out of money are i don't think it's implausible to say they might yeah, also there's some time like lag though because it didn't go up when covid hit and unemployment peaked and then as unemployment I think went it down did, but i'm not an employment expert i'm not really I'm, i did look I, at that at the time we're only talking about a couple months by the way before the floyd effect kicked in um like and but, but what i like is you're providing a mechanism it bothers me people are just like oh covid well, no, uh, like, yes, as it, as it affects employment, COVID certainly affect policing. Um, so I don't want to say that COVID doesn't matter, but it's often just used as like, well, throwing your hands up and going, we don't know why this happened. And only in America, uh, you know, must be COVID. No, let's get, yeah, let's dig deeper. Well, that's, anyway, that's part of the reason deeper. why I'm like, I'm like playing around. And again, yeah. it's purely speculative about the unemployment thing, because unemployment didn't go up as much in Europe, for example, as it did in the US because of COVID, and especially in other New York City, just because of the policies they put in place. They didn't lay off people as much. They just put them on, on temporary leave and kept paying them, for example, right? right? So there's reasons why COVID had a different effect in the United States than elsewhere. And again, I'm and not anywhere saying- Anywhere else? 
Fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. I'm, I'm just saying. Also, I wonder speculatively, why didn't suicide go up in 2020? I don't you know. Get somebody else for that question. That's yeah. completely out of my expertise. Um, well, I, I, you know, I think you know, like I, we can speculate about this all day, but I think there's a lot of potential other explanations for what we've been seeing than bail reform. And on, and what I, what I want to say for the end here, our study really laser focused on people who are in practice affected by bail reform, and by and large. It reduced recidivism. And by and large, no matter who I talk to about this recently, no matter what their predisposition is, whether they're um, generally opponents of bail reform or proponents, when asked about the subgroup effects, right? Oh, people with no criminal history, people charged with misdemeanors, we saw actually much stronger positive effects on recidivism. Um, or beneficial effects on recidivism. I don't want to be misunderstood for the, for that population when they're released without bail. And on the other hand, we saw negative effects for people who had recently been arrested for a VFO. The vast majority of people find that quite intuitive, right? Like, I don't think we're rocking the boat here with these findings. I think, uh, you know, but... Well, the goal is to get those findings out there with that. It's not even nuanced, right? These are basic categories you're talking about. It's I mean, it's nuanced at the simplest level, but... I mean, that's why I wanted to talk to you about this is to to make those uh, points and get that out there. No, I appreciate it. And I think, you know, I, I um, you know, this should be, I think the report should be read very carefully by a lot of people. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I don't know how carefully it was read by everyone. And uh, because I mean, not at all. I'll tell you that. I mean, we know that people don't read reports. They read the summary. Um, they read the newspaper accounts. And, I mean, um, even if you read the three-page summary, I think you get a pretty good picture of what we found. <laughs> um, you know, and and when I read something like, oh, you, we, we saw differential effects across different subgroups, the first thing I would do is like dig into that out of interest. And a lot of reporters did. You know, so I think the word in that regard is out there. I've also seen not only... You know, I wouldn't necessarily use the word cherry picking. I don't want to accuse anyone of doing that. But people focused on different types of, on different aspects of our results, right? What I've also seen is that people simply completely misunderstood them. Um, you know, I, you know, we're learning here. I've never gotten this level of publicity for a study that um, I was involved in. So, you know, and and for what it's worth, we're going to publish a and a document um, where we clarify some of the points that we noticed have caused some confusion um, or at least have have caused different people to to jump to different results that may you know um, may support what they've already believed so we're doing our best to to kind of make sure that the, that the results are really properly understood and and also um, you know, look that in the right context. And again, I think those subgroup results are really important. At the yeah. same time, at the same time, it's equally important to 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 say that um, those high risk subgroups are a tiny minority of cases that were affected by the reforms. And I've, I know I've said this already a couple times, but I think it is really an important point to um, to emphasize. The um. What I would do in key findings, um, just to mess with people who want to oversimplify it, is make the first one say there's no simple key finding, and then I don't know. Um, so at least then you you can say it's on them, um, you know. But um, anyway, let me thank you here um, uh, to to the both listeners still listening now. Um, thank you <laughs> for um, tuning into um, quality policing. I've enjoyed this conversation. So did um, I. And uh, I'm here with Renee Ropak, Senior Research Associate at Data Collaborative for Justice at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And he is co-author with Michael Rumpel of, um, of the uh, Does New York's Bail Reform Law Impact Recidivism? Um, and uh, who would have thought that something uh, that seems so technical would would get such um, attention? But it's important. Um, it's important both for yeah what it shows and and the what part of the jigsaw puzzle of of public safety it, it sort of it's it's the the fitting piece for. 
Um, I am Peter Moskos, and uh, um, there's always more if you go to qualitypolicing.com where this will be up. And um, thanks for listening. Thanks for having me.